welcome to GIS Day uh, 2023 at the University of Idaho. Uh, it's a pleasure to have folks here in person and everyone on with us virtually. Um, as in previous years, we've got a pretty even split. Uh, folks online versus folks registered. Approximately 50 folks registered uh, for in-person and 50 folks uh, online. So thank you very much uh, for attending. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. You'll see them on the screen. Uh, all these folks really make this possible. So if you meet representatives from those entities today, certainly thank them. Thank them for lunch. Thank them for the room, the hosting of the event. Uh, it really couldn't happen without them. Additionally, our planning committee, uh, all of which um, Dr. Lau and, and Lisa are here today back here, uh, who's done a great job to put this together. Uh, Jason Carl, who's out of town. Uh, also, Evan Williamson and Jalisa, who are out of town, but uh, they've done a great job to bring this whole thing together. So today, uh, the planning committee thought it might be interesting to talk about the intersection between artificial intelligence and digital geospatial data. And it uh, seems like such a hot topic where everybody's talking about artificial intelligence. We thought we'd invite speakers who have some expertise and knowledge in that area and share those through the three invited talks that we have today. The short talks will vary in uh, topic uh, re related to GIS, so they'll be from a lot of different uh, perspectives. So hopefully that'll be a, a, a nice mix. But for our three invited talks, uh, we'll take a look at, at kind of the intersection between uh, spatial location and artificial intelligence. So to lead off today is Dr. Wenwen Li who is a professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University, a research interest in geographic information science with a focus on developing integrated and smart cyber infrastructure to revolutionize knowledge discovery in environmental and social sciences. In recent years, she's been pioneering the integration of AI with geospatial sciences and has developed a series of spatially explicit GeoAI models for environmental analysis. She was the recipient of the US uh, NSF's Early Career Award and Mid-Career Advancement Award. She's also a fellow at the American Association of Geography and a fellow at the University Consortium of Geographic Information Science. So with that, Dr. Lee, if you'd like to share your screen and we have about 45 minutes for your talk, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for the very nice introduction and uh, the invitation. Um, it's my great pleasure to share uh, my research and also some of my thought in terms of, of GeoAI. And uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss how GeoAI can advance science and also the science of GeoAI. So before I started, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit about uh, my research in the past few years. So since joining ASU, uh, my group has been focusing on developing this cyber knowledge infrastructure, which is a knowledge-driven data infrastructure addressing the challenges in the entire data lifecycle, from data sharing to um, uh, data discovery uh, of distributed geospatial data to enabling the intelligent search of the data to the integration of a diverse multi-source data to the visualization and the real-time visualization of geospatial data to the intelligent analytics of them. And the GeoAI have been served as intelligence core that power up all the elements in the data to knowledge production pipeline. So uh, before I started um, uh, today's talk related to GeoAI, I would like to introduce a few of these uh, geospatial applications that my group has developed. This Polar Hub is a uh, uh, is a uh, web crawling system that can automatically discover the distributed geospatial data across the whole world. So as you can see, all the green dot on this um, globe shows how many geospatial data and services that has been found in a certain location. And we also provide the filtering based on um, providing countries. So if we take a look at all the data from the US, so these are the their distributions. And we also provide this um, 
categorization through different uh, types of data in earth and environmental science domains. So if we zoom in and click one of the dots, so we will be able to see all the data services provided by a, a certain web host. So here is uh, all the data provided by the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And these different colors of dots shows different types of uh, data. If we click one of the dots, uh, you will be able to view all the metadata as well as the link to the actual uh, data services for us to um, access the data. And for this um, nearly 20,000 unique data records, we have uh, actually collected 1.7 million of unique data layers uh, from the across 155 countries. And you can also easily do a search of the interested data set. Like if I'm interested in some watershed, then these are the data set that has been returned. And you can further do filtering based on the data type by providing countries and also by um, the actual host. And uh, once you click one of these uh, data set, you, you will be able to view a, a thumbnail of that data. And we also develop this cyber infrastructure portal that allow you to overlay the data set from multiple resources. So um, you will be able to conduct an integrated analysis of um, this uh, hydrology based applications. And uh, another of the application I would like to show you is uh, Polar Globe, which is a real-time four-dimensional uh, data visualization portal. And we, I have listed this um, live link um, that is available on my lab server. If you are interested, feel free to get access to it, which will allow you to view what is really happening now in the Earth's atmosphere. Because this uh, Polar Globe portal has been connected to the no casting model of NOAA. So we are grabbing those data in real time, and then it can actually allow you to, sh allow you to see what is happening um, at this moment, and also a as a prediction. So what I'm showing you now is the 2018 North Atlantic um, uh, hurricane season. And there are three hurricanes that has formed in the uh, North Atlantic Ocean. And the one that is closest uh, is the Hurricane Florence. And we can open up the projected, projected uh, trajectory. So you can see where is the approximate affected areas uh, by the hurricane. And we can also enable the 10 day forecast, which is also connected in real time from NOAA's simulation system. So you can see how quickly this hurricane is moving, how much strength it gains, and then where it probably make the landfall, and then how it is moving away uh, from the mainland. Uh, as I mentioned, if we are, you, you are interested to seeing what is happening in the Earth atmosphere now, uh, you are very welcome to get access to this web link um, to see the, the, the data in real time. And another of our recent project is building a knowledge graph that knows where. So what we did is we uh, integrate the and cross-link the, the cross-domain data set so that we can better answer spatial and uh, temporal questions. And here is uh, a portal that we developed to enable the location-aware visualization of uh, the knowledge graph data to support disaster response and uh, humanitarian aid. So as you can see, uh, there are 10 deadliest uh, hurricanes that has hit the U.S. East Coast uh, in the past 50 years. And uh, their location shows uh, where these hurricanes made landfall. And if we click one of them, we are able to see their trajectory and affected area. And we can also see the consequences, which are the damage caused by different uh, hurricanes as it moves. Because when hurricanes pass over the mainland, uh, different counties started to report different um, damage. And here, all these different dots shows different types of uh, damage caused by a uh, hurricane directly or it's cascading uh, disasters like uh, flash flood or heavy rain or a storm surge. 
So uh, in this panel, you can see uh, the statistics about the damage caused by Hurricane Michael. And uh, if we are focusing on what has happening on the ground, we can enable this 2D view. So we, we can see all this um, damage report caused by different types of uh, disasters post the Hurricane Michael. And this is a detailed report of the storm surge that was reported. Um, as you can see here, the total property damage and also the direct cost. So uh, Hurricane Michael has caused the six deaths because of the storm surge. And we are also um, integrating the health profile of um, these local regions to help the relief experts to understand what is where is the most vulnerable communities are located and how we can allocate the medical supplies and other resources to help those vulnerable communities and the vulnerable people. And if you want to take a look at the latest version of uh, this portal, you are welcome to access this link. So as I mentioned, I show you in a few examples of uh, the tools, decision support tool that we developed that related to data discovery, data visualization, and also the uh, decision support and the data uh, analysis. And GeoAI has served as the intelligence core in all of these um, products. So what is the GeoAI? Uh, in a nutshell, GeoAI can be considered as a combination of uh, geography and artificial intelligence. And in this paper, I propose a three pillar view about the GeoAI, computing, AI, and the geospatial data. So it not only includes the application of AI in geospatial problem solving, but more importantly, it also includes the integration of spatial principle and the spatial knowledge to enable the cutting edge AI design. So it can better help not just solving geospatial problems, but also general problems. And my interest in GeoAI is mainly focusing on image and the terrain analysis. So I'm quoting um, Dr. Dan Wright, who's the chief scientist from ESRI. Uh, he, she mentioned in a recent talk that the clear danger of climate change is still with us. And one of the best ways for us to cope with climate change on a global scale is to develop the continuous and near real-time mapping and the monitoring capability for the entire surface of the earth. So um, analyzing the huge amount of uh, satellite imagery and other kind of remote sensing data to understand the environmental change is uh, a critical to address and better understand the impact of climate change. And the GeoAI can have uh, potentially a lot of the benefit to the society as well. So I'm showing you an example of how GeoAI could aid search and rescue operations. This is a news that was posted on uh, Washington Post saying a hacker got lost uh, in the Los Angeles region while he was hiking, but he was able to send this photo to his friend before his phone died. And LAPD has posted this photo on Twitter and asked for people's help. And a guy with a lot of experiences in uh, image analysis and also the local area, knowledge about local areas, was able to pinpoint the approximate location of where this uh, person may get lost. And he was uh, eventually successfully rescued. So think about what GeoAI can do in this scenario, especially when we need to search over a very large region and also um, in a remote areas where not many people have local knowledge about. So we can really see its ability to automate this process and intelligently help people to find uh, locations to save people's life. And the GeoAI can also have a lot of the benefit to understand, to advance the science, especially in um, support RT permafrost research, which is one of the applications that's very close to my heart. Um, for example, what we have been doing in the past few years is to use AI to map the extent of changes of landform um, that are uh, associated with permafrost melting and Arctic change. 
So I'm showing you a few pictures, like pulsar, pingo, and S-wedge the polygons. They are all very beautiful patterned the ground uh, that can be commonly seen in the Arctic region. And in Arctic, a lot of these um, a lot of these landscapes are actually on permafrost, which are frozen ground. And as the temperature is increasing, the permafrost has uh, becoming uh, unfrozen. And then that causes a lot of uh, uh, issues like uh, 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 ground sub subside and other, other challenges. And the change in these landforms is a great indicator of how permafrost is changing and how it affected the, the ecosystems and also the global climate. And what is truly interesting is not only that we can use AI, this cutting edge technology to advance science, but also to inform climate actions. So I'm showing you this photo is um, my colleagues and, and I were attending the geo for good conference organized by Google um, earlier last month. And we were discussing our new Google project of using GeoAI to track in real time the Arctic permafrost saw to inform climate actions. So we really see a possibility of using technology to advance science and then to inform climate actions. So what is a game changer? What Once we develop the capability for near real time mapping of permafrost saw, we can really help the Arctic communities, especially the indig indigenous community to plan for community relocation because a lot of these um, uh, infrastructures and the communities are built upon permafrost. And then when the permafrost started to thaw, the ground is no, no longer stable. So um, a lot of these infrastructure got damaged and uh, people really need to plan ahead about where they should relocate their uh, village or communities. And this is another example about how we can use our science to influence uh, climate policy. And this is uh, Dr. Sue uh, Natalie from our extended project team who's testifying in front of the House of Representatives about how permafrost change could potentially uh, affect the, the entire uh, global climate and uh, how we can uh, develop new policies and the climate actions to help the 5 million people who's living in the Arctic. And uh, besides the Arctic climate change, their uh, GLAI can also see a lot of the applications to support uh, disaster mapping, like the flood inundation mapping. So this is uh, one of our latest work in terms of using a large GLAI foundation models to uh, map the flood inundations. Um, so if we can better understand how the, uh, the the flooded areas, where is the vulnerable communities, um, we can uh, better cope with the climate change, which has caused the more frequent and the severe uh, damage and uh, occurrences um, of the flood. So um, get back to the, the technical uh, trend. So what is the GLES research agenda? In a recent paper, my colleague and I has um, proposes this three phase of the advances in GLAI. The first phase is import. So we basically apply um, a, a off the shell AI model to geospatial problems to help us better solve this problem than traditional algorithms. And the next phase is adaptation. So instead of just the grab uh, cutting edge AI models, we should customize and adapt it in a way that can best suit it for our problem solving. And the next stage, which is even more important, is the export part. Because in geography, there are a lot of these very important spatial principles, like tabular first law and the spatial heterogeneity, which could help us to guide better AI models. So in the end, we not only want to um, better solve geospatial problems. And we also want to develop more powerful AI models that can help us better solve non-geospatial problems. And um, just a little bit introduction about GLAI. So a lot of this revolutionary development is through the advances in deep learning. And um, compared to traditional machine learning where the feature extraction 
um, like to extract important um, attributes that could help us to make a prediction on a certain problems is always need to be done manually by humans. So this is traditional machine learning. But the power of deep learning is it can apply directly to raw data and extract important image features and then make these uh, predictions uh, even more accurately. So that is how deep learning can help to enable this kind of data-driven discovery. And the deep learning's application in image analysis can be categorized into three broader uh, classes. Image recognition is the most uh, simple one. So we mainly uh, need to predict what is inside of the image. So in this case, we can predict there is a ship and there's also a dog and what are the probability of having those objects within the image. And then object detection is uh, a harder problem. So besides predicting what's inside, we also need to predict the location of each uh, object by drawing a bounding box around it. And then instant segmentation goes one step further we further need to delineate the exact boundary of each of these objects. And in our work uh, has been focusing on the, uh, the last two categories. So when we talk about using AI to detect and extract the environmental features, there are a lot of the challenges. So first, Compared to a lot of the man-made features like buildings or uh, airplane or golf course, the natural features uh, tend to have uh, weak boundaries and they also have the inherent complex topographic structures. So I'm showing you a picture here is uh, the Bachelor Canyon in Montana. So if we just look at the picture, it will um, be very hard for us to delineate the boundary as uh, uh, our expert in geomorphology help us to delineate. So that is a, a challenge to develop the training data set for environmental features. And a lot of these features also tend to have the uh, interclass similarity. So basically they belong to different classes, but they look very similar um, from the satellite imagery. I will show you an example in a couple of uh, slides. So to address this challenge, I will show you a series of work that we have been doing that also goes through the three phases of uh, GeoAI research, from import to adaptation to export. So our first work was uh, a simple creator detection problem. So what we did is we collected images for creators and the non-creators from uh, by Google image search. And then we perform the labels and send these images to a very popular object detection model. And here are some of, of the results. So as you can see, uh, the model can predict the creators pretty well, both the larger creators and the smaller ones. And the ones with overlapping boundaries can all be detected. And this uh, creator detection accuracy measured by uh, MAP, which is the mean average precision, um, has reached up to 99%, which means the, the model does very well in terms of this uh, binary uh, uh, creator detection problem. So this is uh, a simple application that help us to beat the learning curve of uh, deep learning. But what was missing here? Uh, as I mentioned, we collected this data set from Google image search. So there are no geolocation associated with this image. So what is missing is a geographical frame that allow us to stack multi layers of information about the same study area so we can gain a more comprehensive view about, about it and help us to better uh, understand our geographical problem at hand. And this is, why spatial data is so special. So uh, that come to our second, uh, second uh, application of leveraging multi-source and multi-modal data for terrain analysis. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing you the value of uh, multi-source data. And here are two lakes, Creator Lake and Mono Lake. They too will appear in uh, very different basins. 
But from satellite image alone, as you can see, they look quite similar in terms of shape and also appearances. But when we add the DM data and its derived parameters, we can actually see quite a distinctive patterns between uh, these two features. So that gives us the confidence of the value of leveraging multi-source data in natural feature detection. So, um, so that comes to our solution of leveraging multi-source, multi-modal uh, deep learning um, to solve this, uh, solve this problem more effectively. So what we did is for different source of data, like a remote sensing, it will get to its own feature extraction pipeline. And then for DM data and its derived parameters, what we did is we conduct a data level fusion to generate a more enriched DM data and then send it to its own feature extraction pipeline. And after the feature are extracted, they are merged here and then send it to the next phase of processing. And we call this approach a combined data level fusion and the feature level fusion approach. So what we did is we compare our approach, which is the blue line uh, to the other two approach. One is uh, the model leveraging only single source data uh, using remote sensing imagery. And this orange line shows we are using purely feature level fusion, which has multiple uh, branch. In this case, there will be four branch of feature extraction pipeline. So our result has shown that um, the proposed multimodal de deep learning approach works better than uh, the other approaches. And this also shows the added value of uh, multi-source data in support of uh, environmental analysis. So we uh, release this data set called the GeoImageNet as an open, uh, open source benchmark data. And in this data set, there are uh, six uh, classes, basin, ridge, valley, and bay, lake, and island. And in each, um, in each of this type, we provide two uh, data set. One is a remote sensing imagery, and the other is an enriched DM by fused multi uh, parameters uh, together. And if we take a look at the average precision per uh, class, so uh, what is very interesting is like for basin, ridge, and valley, we know that these kind of features reside in more hilly terrains. So after adding the DM data, we can observe a substantial increase in the prediction um, uh, in the prediction accuracy. But what is also very interesting is for bay, lake, and island. So we know they mostly re reside in uh, flatter terrains. But after adding the DM data, we can also observe an increase. So this experiment really shows how multi-source data can be leveraged in the terrain and the environmental analysis to further power up the current GeoAI models. And um, there are still challenges in the GeoAI and the supervised learning. Um, all these um, examples I have shown you is leveraging the training data and the supervised model to learn and then to make prediction. But as we know, these kind of GLEI models are very data hungry. So that uh, the training data preparation always associated with high labeling cost. Uh, for example, if we want to do image recognition, which is a simple form of deep learning application, the cost of annotating a single object class uh, will be less than two seconds per image. But when we want to do the object detection work, and the average cost for labeling the bounding box will be about 35 seconds per image. So that's a great increase in terms of uh, uh, annotation time. But what um, is exciting is if we only ask the humans, um, our annotators to label a total object count, it will cost less than one second. Like in this case, uh, the total object count will be four so that will dramatically decrease the total annotation time because our brain are so good at doing counting. And this uh, fact uh, motivated us to develop a new uh, learning strategy 
it's called learning from counting. So instead of asking uh, the training data to provide all the exact uh, bounding box for each of these interested objects, we only need to provide a total object count for this image. In this case, it is uh, three. And then what we did is we enable the model to learning from this object count and predict approximate object location. And then we join several candidate bounding box, and then we do post-processing to filter out and find what is the most um, uh, reasonable and the most accurate bounding box. So this shows an example of how we are learning from less information, but able to predict more to save the data labeling, um, data labeling um, time and cost. And what enables us is we integrate the Tobler first law uh, into this GLAI model design to convert this 2D image processing problems into a 1D sequential data uh, processing problem. Uh, because of uh, the interest of time, I will not expand this uh, method. But if you are interested, you are welcome to um, uh, refer to our paper that published in the annals of AAG. So um, in these three topics, I showed you an example of how we advance the GLEI research agenda through these uh, three phases. So the goal is to um, support better geospatial problem solving and also stronger AI. So as a, a quick summary, uh, what I have introduced is mostly focusing on the pred predictability of a model. So in the last few years, we have been seeing the model trend from smaller task-specific models to larger foundation-based models. And um, the examples I showed you has also converted from um, single type uh, creator detection problem to multi-type uh, feature detection, which includes like six types of natural features. And the data source we use has also expanded from a single source data to multi-source, multi-modality um, uh, deep learning. And the learning strategy has also evolved from uh, purely supervised learning to weekly supervised learning to the recent large models, which uh, use the self-supervised learning in its work. And our recent uh, work that uh, has been published in ACM uh, Six Spatial is leveraging these large geospatial foundation models, which use self-supervised learning to support uh, environmental analysis. And what compose or support the advance of the science of GLAI also includes the AI's interpretability and also reproducibility because only these two properties are preserved, we can better trust the result from the GLAI models and their uh, predictions. So um, uh, what I want to show you here is a challenge for GLAI to have strong replicability compared to um, a classic spatial analysis algorithms like uh, uh, GWR, the geographical uh, weighted regression. So for example, if we want to um, identify how the population density and the income will affect the, uh, the crime rate, in GWR, what it, you will get is a surface which shows what are the, like how different locations, are, um, how these different uh, um, attributes or values at a different location are affecting our outcome, why? But in GLAI, we we cannot simply derive such a surface which shows the different influence. What we can only get here is a weight matrix. And in each cell, it's no longer a constant value, but instead it's a complex nonlinear relationship capturing the relationship between the input variable X and also the output Y. So this challenge and this black box nature of GLAI make it very challenging to uh, seek for the full replicability. To address this, I think it's very important to improve the interpretability of the GLEI models. So in our recent work, we have been exploring of using the model visualization approach to capture which are the most important regions to help the model to make certain detections. For instance, 
um, the model detected this as a meander. So what is the most important uh, feature in this image to help the model to make the prediction? And using our visualization approach, we, we can see that the curved, the curvature part is actually where uh, the model thinks is critical in terms of making the prediction as the meander class. And another example is for volcano detection. So this is a volcano with the flowing ashes. Where is the most important, whether it's a volcano mouse or the flying ashes that help the model to make this uh, prediction? Again, using our model visualization approach, we can see that um, the volcano mouse is actually uh, critical in terms of helping model to make uh, predictions. So I think in the future, more of this method in terms of understanding a GLAS decision-making process is critical for us to improve our understanding and the trustworthiness of the GLAI result. And as a quick summary, um, in the future, we definitely need to develop a better and a stronger models, which has the location awareness and more, more likely using um, self-supervised learning, which um, can learn from the data with uh, fewer uh, data annotation or labels. And we also need to support better science to utilize GLAI to better answer the critical scientific questions. And we also need better training because we need the stronger next generation workforce that can join us to continue growing this uh, exciting field. So in our research, uh, we have recently received a NSF Cyber Training Award to provide the training on advanced AI um, to the Arctic and the geospatial researchers. If you are interested, you can uh, follow our website. We have organized uh, several webinars um, toward that goal. And before I end, uh, I would like to uh, uh, welcome you to join us. So this is a um, GLEI and the Deep Learning Symposium my colleague and myself are organizing in the upcoming AAG, uh, AAG meeting in uh, Hawaii next year. So you're very welcome to join us to co-organize uh, sessions and also present in our symposium so we can work together to grow this uh, exciting communities and exciting research uh, areas. And thanks so much. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. So we have, uh, yeah, some time for questions. This is a, certainly exciting, exciting research. Um, we have a microphone back there. Uh, yes, we do. Who has questions for Dr. Lee? Anyone? Anyone uh, on Zoom? We'll also uh, take any online that we have as well. Nothing yet? Anybody in the room? No, they're all planning their trips to Hawaii. Well, I have one on the on the uh, detection on those objects where you showed the meandering. So it's detecting parts of that image, um, as I gather, for important parts of that image. Is there going to become a point where it detects the feature as a whole, like a meander? I mean, it can delineate those, I guess, between roads or streams or or lava flows, that it starts to look at the entirety of an object as opposed to just pieces of the object. Uh, yes, it would. Uh, well, detecting the whole object, um, I think what one of the interesting thing of deep learning is hierarchically extract the important image features from low level features like uh, the texture. So between meander and the road, I think the texture will play a very important role. And then, um, and then it's gradually to the gradually composite this uh, low level image features to generate a a whole shape of this object. So uh, depending on, I think, the different characteristics of uh, either it's a man-made feature or uh, a natural features or different kinds of natural features, there's a different uh, part, there's different local um, characteristics uh, play an important role. So what we did is we, we know what is a model's output and then we back propagate to the input data to see, oh, which part is the most important for it to categorize 
it is a meander than a river. Say. So in this case, I think the curved part, which is a, a very prominent feature for, for a meander is captured instead of the entire shape. Okay. Questions online, anyone in the room? No, nothing. I have one more then. <laughs> um, early in your uh, discussion uh, on the uh, damage assessment on the hurricanes and that type of thing, and it looked like um, you were able to map the damage across a geographic area and talking about uh, you know, that move to kind of real-time data and understanding what's happening, in a, a, uh, you know, right now. So how close is, are we to, to really achieving that? It seems like we're still, you know, at a point where we kind of receive a lot of data post-event and we analyze it after, but it seems like it's closer and closer to getting real-time. And then maybe with these AI pieces that the prediction takes place, you know, before the event. Yeah, well, I think this is a, still a challenge, right? So what we did is um, uh, for Hurricane Ian, which happens last October, uh, last October, uh, what we can do is quickly integrate some of the real-time data that becomes available, like a NOAA's uh, real-time trajectory for Hurricane Ian. And then based on the historical analysis, we can quickly pull out the health profiles in the uh, in the possible affected region, and then to help the health expert to understand where they should distribute the, the medical supplies, where are the clinics are located. But in terms of grabbing other on-ground uh, information, I think it is pretty challenging, even in the US where we have a lot of data, because the local regions may have power outage, and that will affect the collection of um, the real-time data, and also for transportation, like road damage information and all of that, they are all managed, I think, by different departments. So how to coordinate this resource sharing across different department and entity is also another challenge. Of course, we can have some of the alternative, uh, alternative solutions. Like if we can quickly grab the satellite imagery that happens before and after, I think we can do um, a proxy about the potential uh, damage that has caused. And this is not a, a easy problem to solve, but I, I hope that with all this technology and the better coordination of resources, data resources and other kinds of resources across department, we can solve it better. And it is only worse in some other countries like Central America. So they do not even have the basic data infrastructure available. So we are, when we are trying to uh, understand and analyze the disaster even or post the disaster analysis, it becomes super challenging because the health profile information, the basic road infrastructure, they're all missing from like those more developing countries. So how can we use our AI technology? So analyzing uh, from uh, satellite imagery, uh, from OpenStreetMap, some cross-sourcing uh, 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 data data platforms to help them to build this basic and the fun fundamental data infrastructure to to make them more resilient to disasters is also another I think another goal we can try to achieve. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Looks like we have a question in the room and online. Oh. You'll start there. Okay. <laughs> I have a question in the room. Thank you. I have a question about the AI system that you are using. Uh, where did this come from? Is this something you developed yourself or, or who is providing it? Um, that's a good question. Well, there are actually several AI systems uh, we are using. So mostly we, um, we follow the cutting edge AI models. Uh, many of them are open source. Uh, for example, the IBM and, and NASA has recently released a large geospatial foundation model called the PRISWI, and it's open source. So everyone can download and test and use it. So what we did is once we grab these models, uh, as I mentioned, each geospatial problem has their unique challenges. And how can we develop and integrate these, this advanced learning strategy into these models to, to make sure that it is more suitable for 
uh, our problems at hand. I think that's uh, also very critical. But the first step is always learning, trying to use it, uh, applying it, test it with its baseline, and then seeking approach to further uh, improve it to better solve our problems. So mostly our models are from the general AI domains, but what is very exciting is we are seeing a lot of these large geospatial models um, that has become available, which can also be uh, very helpful and useful for our research. Yeah, I have two questions from Felix online. He asks, how would GeoAI be used in analyzing vector data as compared to raster data? And the second question is, do you have any examples of using GeoAI in social sciences? Okay, so I think um, this is a very interesting question. You know, uh, when the deep learning was first uh, proposed, it is the design of it is better addressed and to solve image analysis problems. So basically raster analysis. But now I think uh, a number of the advanced method uh, that can also develop uh, used for vector data analysis. So depending on your needs, uh, for example, if um, you want to uh, compare the different shapes, so what you can do is you take this vector data, which is a series of coordinates, basically, and then you conduct a location encoding. So you convert from its original raw latitude and longitude information to a high dimensional representation called embeddings. So it is a it is a like a vector a representation of your original uh, data set. And after you're doing this uh, location location embedding to generate this new uh, embedded vectors. And then you can compare based on different similarity, distance, um, depending on your needs, like compare different shapes, comparing their distances and others. So location encoding is approach to handle uh, vector data analysis. And in terms of social science analysis, like a lot of our uh, research has been um, applying environmental, uh, applying to the solving earth and environmental problems. There are uh, a lot of applications in handling like uh, people's trajectory, predicting where is the next stop of uh, a pedestrian. So those could also be considered as the, the social science application. There are uh, abandoned uh, applications related to that as well. Well, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, setting the tone for our day. And we're excited to learn more. And uh, if you're willing to share your slides, we'll make them available to folks through our resource um, repository and, uh, you know, to follow those uh, articles out there and look up those citations. And, and thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lee. Thank you.